Would you like to really connect with your audience? I'm sure you would. Well, I'm here to help, and I'm Malcolm, and this is Tuesday Teaching Tips. It's episode 227, and we're taking a fourth look at a terrific little book called The Heart of Communication by Rob Parsons. And today we're talking about that connection we make at the beginning of a talk. He quotes Karl Buchner when he says this, they may forget what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. How you made them feel. Don't you love it when people connect with you, when people are speaking to you and you feel that connection? And then maybe you'll better remember what they're trying to say as well. But making that connection, John Maxwell said, also Rob quoting, everyone communicates, few connect. Everyone communicates, they say things, but do they really connect? And we're here as speakers surely to do our best to connect. Four points today. Number one, know your audience. Now, if you're a minister in a congregation a bit like me, you may feel like, yeah, I know my audience, I know my people, but do you know what's going on now? Not just necessarily their background, when they became a Christian, their family upbringing, or what's been going on in the last 12 months, or six, even six months ago, or even two weeks ago, but what are they going through, what they're going through right now? This is why it's so important for us to be in touch with one another during the week as we prepare a lesson for the, uh, the upcoming Sunday. And if it's a large congregation, you clearly can't be in touch with everybody, but at least with a representative sample, because as the weeks and the months and the years go by, we, we stay connected, we keep that sense of cu uh, being current. And then as we sit down to prepare our lesson, we're not just preparing the text, we're preparing the text in the light of those to whom we are going to be speaking. And that matters greatly. It helps us to interpret what we're reading and studying and applying it, in a way that's actually going to help. In other words, it's going to connect with what that congregation needs or what that group needs at that moment in time. Really important. And if you are a visiting speaker, then what you need to do, of course, is to connect ahead of time. Ring up the person organizing or the person who's invited, invited you and ask him or her what's going on. What, are the situ what is the situation? What's the context of that group? And what is it that I particularly might be able to do to help the group I'm speaking to? Rob says this, try to get an understanding of the diversity of people to whom you will be speaking and ask what it is the organizers are hoping to get from your visit. Get some color, get some background. So what do you do? You ask in advance what the needs are. And then secondly, you turn up early. Uh, when I'm logging in on Zoom, whether it's my own congregation or another one, I, I open up uh, 30 minutes early. If I'm going somewhere to speak, I try and get there 15 to 30 minutes early. And when you get there early, you don't hide away at the back, you meet people. You mingle and you talk and you get a feel for what's going on. And I do that on, in the online meetings whether it's Watford or Thames Valley, wherever I'm speaking, I like to have a little bit of banter and chat with the people who are arriving early. Some people always arrive early and you can catch up with them and you get a feel for what's going on. And that even last minute can affect what I say and in particular, perhaps how I say it. Really helpful to do that. And of course, if no one turns up early, that's okay. You're there, you're there early. You can pray or you can read through your notes and it's still not exactly going to be wasted time, is it? So number one, Know your audience. Number two, don't waste the start. Don't waste the start. In other words, don't ramble at the very beginning. Hello, I'm Malcolm, I'm here, it's nice to be here, nice to see you, yes, lovely weather, and uh, thank you for the invitation, and, uh, and uh, it, it's all rambling. That doesn't help anybody. Certainly, be, be, uh, be, you might express gratitude for the opportunity to speak, especially if you're a visiting speaker, but don't ramble on about that. Uh, pay respect to your audience by telling them something that they're going to want to listen to. Uh, some surprising statement, some question at the beginning that, go that shows people, signals to people that what you have to talk about today is important and it's going to be helpful and interesting and relevant for them. You might want to prepare that first sentence or two, even just a phrase, and maybe write it out, memorize it so that you know what it is you're going to say and it's going to help grab people's attention. On occasion, introducing yourself in more detail can be appropriate, and I've recorded on that already in Teaching Tip 225, so you can go back and look at that, that's 225, about the topic of ethos, which is connected with that uh, issue. Rob says this about introductions. He says, introductions need to be effective, but not too long. 
renowned 19th century preacher C.H. Spurgeon summed it up well. He said this, It is always a pity to build a great porch to a little house. A great porch to a little house. Make your introduction in the appropriate length and captivating, but don't make it too long. Third point, get people on the bus. Get people on the bus. Don't assume that everybody in your audience is at the same place in life. Uh, you've got married in your have you got marriage in your in your audience? Unmarried people, singles, uh, widows, widowers. Have you got the older and the younger in age? Have you got the older and the younger in spiritual terms? In terms of how long they've been Christians, these people have different needs. All are different and need something from your lesson. Indeed, I believe the Word of God does bring something for everybody, no matter what kind of group and no matter how diverse that group is. But being aware of it matters, so that you don't un unintentionally alienate a group. The person who speaks primarily from a marriage perspective to a group of married uh, people, married people within the audience, and yet leaves out something that's there for the singles, is, uh, well, is un uncaring, really. We need to be aware of, as best we can, the different kinds of life situations people are in, in the group, so they can get on board with what you're talking about in particular, that particular day. At least part of your introductory remarks at the beginning should be aimed at getting everybody on board. Uh, this, and getting people on board doesn't happen just because we say people should pay attention, but because we demonstrate that we have an awareness of the diversity of the audience. So you might say something like, I have some points in today that I think will help you if you've been married for five years or 15 years or 25 years. I think I have some things here for you if you're unmarried or, or were previously married. I think I have some things here that will help you as a younger Christian, but also as someone who's been perhaps following Jesus for many decades. I think that, in, and you, that you don't have to say that every time in those exact words, but something that indicates, no, there's something here for everybody. I'm aware that we're not all one homogenous kind of group. If you speak to the same group uh, every week, of course, you might not need to say quite as much on that because they know you and they know you know them, but Every now and again, you might want to signal that you're aware of the diversity in the group. Fourthly and finally, make them welcome. Make them welcome. In other words, don't tell them off. Don't scold them. Imagine they are guests in your home. You're going to have a guest in your home and saying, why are you wearing that shirt? Why are you wearing those shoes? Why are you turning up five minutes late? Why are you... Uh, 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 you're not going to be saying that to a guest in your home. So why say that in a church lesson context? There are times for a challenge. That is true, and very, very rarely as a speaker there's a time for a rebuke. But surely, 90% plus of the time, we're there to welcome people and, be, and, and work on things together and be a, be a community and be a family that's striving to grow and learn together. And so we don't scold people. We don't tell them off. Be unres unreservedly positive towards the people you're speaking to. If someone comes in at the back late, don't tell them off. Don't point it out. Yes, okay, I admit it. I have done exactly that. I saw it done once uh, back in 1986. Some of you may remember, if you were around that time, I remember when, um, well, I won't tell the whole story now, but a lot of people were rebuked for being late, and it was meant to be kind of funny, but kind of pointed and it came across kind of funny to the people that weren't late but the people who were late for whatever reason which could have been perfectly legitimate it made them feel terribly judged and looked down on literally in this case because it was balcony people who were on time looking down on the people <laughs> down on the floor level who were the late ones I, I imitated that once thinking it was a good idea it was a terrible idea even if you do it in jest just don't do it don't don't, don't make fun of people in that way. It's tremendously disrespectful. You don't know why they're late. They, they could have been involved in an accident on the way. They could have stopped to help somebody. They could have, I mean, who knows? So I uh, share my own trauma here because I did it and I regret it. But don't, don't scold your, your audience. Um, <laughs> on a memorable occasion many years ago, uh, I was in, uh, in North West London uh, speaking there. And I was preaching, and we had, uh, what, 100, 200 people in the room. And there were some young children at the back, some toddlers, 
who were running around, running up backwards and forwards across the width of the, of the hall. And they were being very noisy. They were more than talking. They were kind of shouting. They were having, a, I think, quite a good time. I don't remember if they were upset or whether they were just talking loudly, but it was very distracting to the congregation and to me. And there are times when you've just got to, you've just got to get on with it, right? The show must go on, so to speak. And some, dist some interruptions are inevitable. Some noises are inevitable. You just have to not draw attention to them. But on this occasion, I thought, it's so distracting. I've got lots of people in the congregation keep turning around to have a look, you know, what's going on back there. And I was very tempted to say to the parents who I assumed were in the room, sort your children out. Come on. I mean, we're trying to listen to the word of God here. And as that went, thought went through my mind, I thought, that's not going to be helpful. I don't know what's going on with the parents. I don't know what's going on with the children. Perhaps they're ill. Perhaps something else has happened. I can't tell from up here what's going on back there exactly, so let me not do that. And so I chose to say something like, uh, what did I say, something like, it sounds like some of our children need some comfort, some comforting. Some of our children here today need some comforting, I think. Could we arrange that? And it was really interesting because the congregation responded with a kind of a, hmm, I don't quite know how to put it, but the whole congregation gave me that kind of hmm. And it wasn't a judgmental hmm, like, yeah, I'm glad someone's pointed that out. Those parents need to sort it out. It wasn't that. It was a, yeah, that's, that's, that's well put. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. And, and interestingly enough, uh, whether it was parents or somebody else at the back there, they did get up and they, um, they um, comforted their children. I, I didn't see anybody be harsh with their children. They just dealt with it in a healthy way, it seemed to me, and the congregation were able to relax, and the people, and the parents or whoever was looking after the children at the back didn't feel like I was down on them, which I wasn't, but I was a bit annoyed, to be honest, but I wasn't down on them. I've been a parent of young children myself, and uh, yeah, okay, it's uh, it can be challenging. So it's important that we have this positive attitude. On the same lines, avoid the pointing finger. You people need to, you should, you need, to, you ought to. Avoid that you thing. It's very negative. And as, as has been said many times, these three fingers are pointing back at you anyway. So uh, no, none of that pointing stuff. Using the open hands, we, us, our congregation, our hearts, we work on these things together. We uh, can learn to love God better or learn to love the poor or learn to love the needy or we can learn to love one another. I mean, we, it's we and us, isn't it? We're all in the same boat together. No speaker is standing over his congregation or her congregation. We are speaking together with each other in conversation, striving to be our best for God. So let's avoid the pointy finger and let's avoid the you business. So to wrap up, uh, what are your thoughts on the question of connection? Are there any times to point the finger? Are there any times to be accusatory towards a congregation? Maybe. I mean, if you can think of some, let me know. Am I right about this emphasis of us being tremendously positive with one another when we speak? A couple of questions for you to reflect on and for me to reflect on. You, not you, me, us, for us to reflect on. Yes, okay. A couple of questions for us to reflect on. What, in your experience, makes the biggest difference in connecting with the audience? So in, in all of your speaking that you've done or you've seen others do, what makes the biggest difference in making that connection with those who are listening? I'd like to know what you think about that. What do you think makes the biggest difference? So drop me a line. You can email me. Malcolm at MalcolmCox.org. You can find me on the website, MalcolmCox.org. Leave me a message there. There's a voicemail facility. And if you know anybody who might benefit from this, please pass the link on. If you haven't already done so and you're on YouTube, then hit that subscribe button. We're getting up towards 700 subscribers now, which is astonishing. And if you have any other thoughts about this topic, do let me know. Now, next week, we're going to take a break from this series because we're coming up to the end of the year hence the Santa hat behind me and the uh, winter jumper, Christmas jumper. And I'm going to be talking for the next two weeks about how to assess your speaking year and to plan for the year ahead. And then we'll pick up this series again 
in January 2021, believe it or not. Well, I think that'll do for today. I do hope and pray that you have a terrific Tuesday and a wonderful week. Take care and God bless. <laughs>